Welcome to the Mark Steiner Show right here on the Real News Network. It's good to have you all with us once again. Well, today we're going to take a look at the political struggles that lie ahead of us in the wake of this election, and then take a journey back to our not so far distant past to look at another historic battle on the left that has consequences to this day. First, we take a look at the growing chasm between the centrist and progressive Democrats. Its effect on everything from potential cabinet appointments to race in America, to the Green New Deal, to healthcare, and more. We'll be talking with Bill Fletcher Jr. He's a racial justice labor international activist and noted author, and with Chani East, who's an organizer of the Poor People's Campaign and the founder of Illinois for Bernie. So stay with us. They have some very sharply different perspectives and really important ones. You want to miss, don't want to miss that. Then we journey to the past to look at the trial of the Chicago 7 that was recently released as a film on Netflix. And we'll be talking with Rennie Davis, who was one of the co-defendants in that trial back in 1968, when activists demonstrating at the Democratic National Convention were viciously attacked by the Chicago police and then put on trial for conspiracy. At least eight of them were, down to seven. And we'll talk about that in that segment. So please enjoy our first conversation about the left in this next election that we just finished and enjoy. So today we're going to talk with our two guests. Bill Fletcher has been a racial justice, labor, international activist for a long time. He's written numerous books, including their Bankrupting Us and 20 Other Myths About Unions and Solidarity Divided, and the mystery novel that I love, The Man Who Fell from the Sky. And we're also joined by Shawna East, who is an organizer and activist, was a member of the coordinating committee for the Illinois Poor People's Campaign, founder of grassroots campaign, Illinois for Bernie, and a battler on the DNC. And Shana and uh, Bill, welcome. Good to have you both with us. Thanks for having me. Great to be on the program. <laughs> Let me just begin. I mean, here we are just, you know, barely past this election. Um, Donald Trump has not conceded and probably will not concede to the last minute if he ever concedes. Uh, and it already seems that we're seeing a dynamic play out here with the centrist forces inside the Democratic Party and the progressive forces inside the Democratic Party at odds. We saw Abigail Spanberger from Virginia and other centrist Democrats who barely won accuse the progressives of being the reason that they lost. Medicaid, Medicare for all, new green economy and the rest. You have uh, AOC and other progressive congressional leaders saying, no, it's the opposite. Every time we campaign for Medicare for all, we won. Uh, we're not the cause. Your lack of having a central focus for working people is the cause. So let's talk about what the cause, what's going on here. And also let me add into that equation, um, you can agree or disagree with this, is the kind of overwhelming strength and organizational ability of the right in this country that has been building for the last 50 years. Um, and I just, so what does that leave, what happens in this interregnum and beyond? And uh, Shana, since this is your first time here on the show, uh, let me start with you. One of the exit polls I thought was pretty interesting showed that people over who voted for Biden overwhelmingly were doing so to vote against Trump. So I think one issue the Democratic Party is having and that they're going to need to, you know, I mean, reckon with is that they aren't giving people a platform I mean, they have a symbolic platform, but they're not speaking to people's basic needs right now in this time. So I think that's what's going on between the progressives and the moderates is that the moderates are more corporate driven and the progressives are more trying to address the basic needs of the people. Let's start with uh, uh, Shannon's first point. Yes, this was a broad front at the national level against Trump and Biden, and his people were masterful. I think that what people have to understand is that the anti-Trump front did not correspond to the down-ballot elections. So in other words, you'd have people that would vote against Trump, but vote for conservatives uh, down-ballot. And that's not really surprising. And that speaks to a weakness in the Democratic Party's approach of um, uh, uh, programmatically that we needed candidates, I would argue, down ballot, that were much stronger and more to the left. And I, that's why I agree with AOC, 100%. Uh, the other thing, though, I want to say about the election, Mark, I want to get this in. 
um, is that this was an election around race, revanchism, and a rejection of reality. And just I want to focus on that last part for a second, because I think that a lot of people don't really want to accept that 70 million people voted against reality. They voted against the reality that we have a COVID-19 pandemic. They voted against the reality that we have an environmental catastrophe. They voted against reality. Now, people can say, well, some people uh, you know, were willing to tolerate various views that Trump had, but you know, whether they believe them or not. But the reality is that people were prepared to take that step. That means that speaks to this very broad right-wing populist base that's out there. It's been out there for a long time, as you were pointing out, and we're going to have to come to grips with it. Well, let's explore that a bit more. I mean, it, I mean, and you know, when you and, and what that means to come to grips with all of this. I mean, if you look at this election, it's clear that in in these in the states that were on the the edge, going either way, Wisconsin and Michigan, and perhaps now we'll see what happens in Georgia. Um, uh, that that the black vote and the black community and communities of color, especially Mexican American communities in some other states like Arizona, are the reasons that the Democrats actually won. That flipped it over. They're part of the reason. Part of the reason. Oh, well, let's get, well, I'll let you jump back in on that. I mean, they were pushing well, that. Okay, so what has to be figured out, no one is quite sure just yet, is that what it looks like is that Biden was able to flip back in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan uh, the vote that had gone for Trump in 2016. But I say that very cautiously because what's not clear is whether he flipped the voters or whether what happened was that the segment of the electorate that had been demobilized by the Clinton campaign in those areas ended up becoming remobilized in this election, right? So we don't know. Uh, the, the union vote um, nationally seems to have been around 57 to 60% for Biden. Um, so, so, I, I, so yes, the African-American Latino vote was, was central, but something else happened in those swing states. And I think it's gonna take some time to, to unpack what it was. Bill's giving Biden a little too much credit. I honestly think it was a lot of grassroots organizing going on, like the Poor People's Campaign and other groups that were, they were mobilizing, organizing, registering people and educating them to vote. They weren't saying vote for Biden or Trump. They were just registering people to vote. And there was a high percentage of people who voted in this election that had never voted before. So I don't think it was so much the Biden campaign as a lot of work happening on the ground in those states. I don't disagree, Shaina. But what I do think is that the Biden campaign did something that Hillary missed in 2016, which is that they kept their focus on the swing states. And when you have an electoral college, which is one of the most undemocratic mechanisms that one can imagine, they needed to do that. Uh, but I don't think that that's, uh, I, I agree with Shana, and I think that we can see, particularly in like in Arizona, a number of other states, where these non-democratic party organizations made a substantial difference in terms of mobilization. And you can see in Florida where there was insufficient attention to that by the Democratic Party and why it hurt. I also think Hillary Clinton had a different public profile than Biden. You know, not as many people really know about his past, I think. Um, he was kind of like a meme during the Obama years, like, oh, funny Uncle Joe. And, you know, Hillary Clinton was hated, you know, from when she was a first lady through her, you know, put, sticking her nose in where it doesn't belong or other sexism that she, you know, had encountered throughout her public life. And, you know, she was just not a great um, candidate, I think, at that time. <laughs> but yeah, I think that was part of it as well. So let me push this point a bit further, and, uh, because I think it's really important for us to kind of, we, we don't know the answers yet. This is going to take, I think, as you said, Bill, some analysis coming out post-election, what really happened. But this is a question about that. It's also a question about strategically what happens next. I mean, so 
I, I remember doing a series of programs about these up to 16 million people who voted for Barack Obama in 2008 who did not vote in 2016. Mm -hmm. Disillusioned. Many of them mm -hmm. in communities of color, many young people disillusioned saying, I'm done with this. And many of them came back in this election, we think, we don't know, mm -hmm. but we think. Um, and you have a situation where the progressives, most people on the left, and most progressives and people on the left within the Democratic Party as well, decided to fight for Joe Biden. And even with some of them sloganeering, uh, beat Trump, battle Biden, and, and all kinds of things in between mm -hmm. and around there. So the question is, what happens now? I mean, uh, the, you know, as I said earlier, you have an extremely well-organized and powerful right wing um, that Donald Trump got the second most amount of votes of any presidential candidate in U.S. history. Biden got the first, obviously. And you've got Democrats that are, in some senses, in disarray, very split. Um, and so this is a very, uh, I mean, the, the, the future is really uncertain. You have the courts packed by the right on top of all of that. Um, and the diminishing power of labor. They're trying to get back, but the diminished power over the years. So where do you see the struggle going? I'm just where you both see the struggle going between now and January 20th, where the new president is sworn in and beyond, because this is not going to be um, an easy time. So what I, what I do in my work, what I'm focused on is organizing poor and low income folks. And I think what we need to do is organize around a set of demands that work for working class people. And I think we need to fight. I think people in power um, stay in power because they continue to divide those class, you know, that class us. <laughs> and so we need to work and work against that and be incredibly disciplined in fighting against those, you know, people who wish to divide us. I think we're going to have a few challenges. So um, the defeat of Trump does not mean that right wing populism has been defeated. And I would argue that it remains the principal uh, a problem right now that we're confronting. Um, we're going to have a second, uh, secondary problem with the centrist Democrats. And, and the centrist Democrats are going to be the ones that are going to be uh, essentially promoting the idea of let's reach across the aisle to the Republicans. Uh, let's let's uh, try to you know, cut a better deal, uh, be nice, nice. Uh, they're going to be the ones that are trying to ta uh, uh, tone down uh, the left rhetoric and left directions. And I think we're going to have a battle with them. Um, but I think we have to understand that there's a difference in terms of the battle. The, um, the right-wing populist movement seeks our annihilation. And I don't use that term as a euphemism. They seek our, our annihilation. And, and so we are in really the fight of our lives. The fight of our lives didn't end on November 3rd. And then also this issue of with the, the, the battle with the, um, uh, the centrist Democrats is, is pivotal because it's a fight over strategy. It's over the soul of the Democratic Party. Um, and I think that that fight uh, needs to uh, pursue, be pursued along the lines of what Shana was raising. You need to be very concrete demands and pressures on the Democratic Party and on Biden-Harris to move in the direction that we need. Uh, I am very worried that what will happen is a version of what happened when Obama was elected. When, you know, it was sort of, okay, Obama was going to be the adult in the room and was going to be sticking out his hand to McConnell uh, and trying to make nice nice. And, you know, as the saying goes, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. We can't afford to make that mistake again. I think moderate Dems created Trumpism. I think the Democratic Party lost tons of seats during Obama's, you know, terms. And I think now we can see in the, in the exit polls and whatnot this time, more low income voters move to Biden. So it's not really a mandate for Biden. I see it as a mandate for the working class and for, you know, beginning to the Democrats to begin to fight for our needs. 
Uh, Shane, I agree with that, but I, I, I would say this, um, because of things that I've been watching in the last few days, I think it's really important that we articulate that Biden has a mandate for change. And yeah. the reason I say that is that every time the Republicans get elected, whether they have the popular vote or not, they always position themselves and say, we have a mandate from the public. And this almost always goes uncontradicted. Democrats get elected and then we start going through this hemming and hawing and do we really have the mandate? Maybe we don't, maybe we have a slight mandate or whatever. Hell with that. We got to say, no, no, we got the mandate. We got the mandate for change. And you know what? Audacity will be our watchword, right? Audacity, not putting out our hands. No, we're going to move. We're going to move fast. And so I think the way that we progressives frame this is going to be very, very important. But it's not just the rhetoric of change that we need, which is what the Democrats tend to do. We need actual change. So will they do that? I don't know. Who knows? But that depends on us. Us, the people, to put the right. pressure on them. Exactly. But I'm saying that we got to frame this because the, because the imagery becomes very important. Trump lost the popular vote in 2016. But from that point on, there was almost no discussion, except maybe parenthetically, about the fact that this guy had no popular mandate. But right. nevertheless, we, were, we allowed that to happen. I'm saying we can't allow that to happen. But Trump was very good at creating the illusion that he had the mandate. Every good movement relies on propaganda. Every good movement. He pulled it off. We should learn likewise. So let's talk, let me pick up on this point here, the two of you. I mean, I, I, you know, I, there, 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 are, there are a lot of ways to think about this. But so the question is, how does that happen? When you have, see, I think there are a lot of people in America who look at the progressive, quote unquote, agenda, the green economy, dealing with systemic racism, getting to the root of that, unearth, getting rid of it, saving the planet, all that people believe that, that, that it's couched in ways that many people um, would, su would support, taking away the ideology for a moment, right? So the question is, what, what, if, if, if that's the case, and that's one of the reasons that progressive Democrats are winning where they won, by pushing that agenda, then what does that mean strategically now? If there's no, is there a cohesiveness enough in the left, in progressives, inside the Democratic Party, and out, to make that happen, what you're suggesting, Bill. How do you do that? How do you build this cross-racial class alliance that you're talking about, Shana? I mean, so it seems to me that so there's, a, there's a huge gap between the, the, the rhetorical nature of our conversation together and what the political reality is that we face. So I think that what we lack is organization. Um, and we, meaning progressives, uh, that we remain very fragmented. Uh, that in order to move the kind of agenda that's being raised here, it's not just about echo chambers, although they're very, echo chambers are very important. Um, it really is about organization. And what happens among progressives, frankly, Mark, are very divided about electoral politics and about how important electoral politics is. The right wing is not divided about it. Um, and, and so what happens is that it's very difficult for progressives to develop a coherent electoral strategy. Take DSA, for example, the Democratic Socialists of America. Very large organization. And at the 2019 convention, comes up with a Bernie or bust platform, only going to support Bernie, no comprehensive electoral strategy to guide what their chapter should be doing around any of these other elections. It's like, We've got to move beyond that and thinking about the fight for power at the municipal level, county, state level, as well as the national. We can't just be engaged every four years when there's a presidential race. And so I think that that really weakens our ability, as opposed to the right, which beginning in the late 60s, the so-called new right, developed a very comprehensive multi-level strategy that had um, electoral work, litigation, and mass movements, all as part of their effort to reshape the entire uh, discourse within the United States. 
we seem to think on uh, progressives all too often that it's one or the other. It's either electoral politics or mass action, street heat or lobby, and not understanding that all of these things have to be in play. Well, it's going to sound like I'm just shamelessly plugging my group, but the Poor People's Campaign is doing an excellent job with our fusion movement because we're not like working in individual silos on these issues. We're talking about ending poverty, ending ecological devastation, ending the war economy, uh, and fighting the false moral narrative, like all together in one campaign. The other thing is I think we need to start talking less about left versus right and more about right versus wrong. I think these labels further divide. You know, we're already divided on the left, progressives, liberals, you know, and, and Bill's right. The right is incredibly organized. And so my approach and the Poor People's Campaign approach is to just get rid of those labels we talk about the issues and we invite in anyone who's willing to fight together because we need to unite and we need to like unite around an agenda that we all, you know, can fight for. I hear you. I don't think it works. We can get rid of any labels we want. And as the right shows all the time, they call Joe Biden a socialist. Joe Biden a socialist, right? I mean, I repeat that. Joe Biden, right? So the point is that we can uh, remove whatever labels we want. Those labels are not self-congratulatory. They basically are to identify political tendencies. And, and, and I think that, I mean, if you don't want to call yourself a leftist, you don't call yourself a leftist. But the reality is that the other side will, right? And the other side knows that we are talking about fundamental social transformation and not in a fascist direction. So, I mean, that's just the reality. So before we get into specifics here, which I want to do before we conclude our conversation, I'm, I'm looking back to what Sean had just said though, so with, with, and, and because you, what you're saying here is in a sense a strategy that goes back. I mean, all of us in this conversation, the three of us in this conversation have all spent, considerable time as organizers, either in labor or community or somewhere else. Um, and, you know, I remember, let me get two quick examples of what, of what I'm talking about here, because it has to do with race and the right and racism in this country and the working class and, and what, how you build a movement. And so I'm thinking about in Baltimore, we had a group called the Tenants Union Group back in South Baltimore in the early 70s that we organized. Um, and it was the first interracial tennis group in the country, I mean, in, the, in, the, in, the, in Maryland. Uh, and it ended up actually changing the laws, and we had all these direct actions and brought people who were divided by one major street between black and white together in one group, despite the racism. And, made, and people worked together to change things and actually built a movement and actually dealt with racism because of the movement itself. You know, I think about the Mississippi woodworkers. Um, but people don't even know about this struggle very much, but there was a struggle that I was in and out of where they were white and black, almost 50-50, in Mississippi. Uh, racism divided them. The women got together and forced the union to address what they had to do and pushed them into becoming a, a, a multiracial union that allowed uh, white and black to be elected every other year, president and vice president. Having said, I'm saying this because I think that's part of the problem that, Shannon, I think you're trying to make is that you have to build this movement that maybe is just outside of all the typical left and right. But the reality also politically is what Bill is saying is the left and right is our reality, given the massive power of the right wing. So, so in the next, in this battle as Biden's president and Kamala Harris as vice president, what, how, did, how did the two of you take those ideas and come together in a strategy that makes something work? Go back to Bill's point, I think, you know, our enemy or whatever, whoever will use these labels to divide us or as a tactic or whatever. But I think to be able to have a true big tent campaign or organization, you have to truly be willing to let people in who you don't see eye to eye with on every single issue, but you might have the same 
views on the economy or systemic racism or you know the green new deal you just have to or else you i don't feel like you're serious about building power and the democratic party has had a very difficult time being open minded when it comes to even progressives within their own party and that's a big mistake and i really truly hope they'll use this time to reflect on it because this election shouldn't have been that this close i mean we're dealing with comic book villains here <laughs> And it was this close. <laughs> so I, I, you know, fingers crossed, we'll be seeing some reflection from the Democratic Party. I think that the level of unity depends on which battles we're talking about. As you know, Mark, I've been a, a trade unionist for all of my adult life. So I know something about organizing workers. And uh, I didn't walk into a shipyard waving a red flag. Uh, suggesting that uh, there needed to be the immediate introduction, introduction of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Um, <laughs> you didn't do that? No, no, actually, I stayed away from that. Um, so, so I understand a little bit about organizing struggles. And, and, um, and you begin when you're doing base or organizing with where people are at. I'm talking at the level of strategy, so forgive me. I'm talking about the level of strategy, not at the level of individual battles or even campaigns. There's a lot of campaigns that we're gonna be engaged in where we have to look uh, always very broadly and we always have to be uh, non-sectarian, anti-sectarian in our approach. Uh, that said, history has demonstrated time and again that there's many battles where the racial divide can temporarily be overcome. But in the absence of a more comprehensive analysis that is grasped by the rank and file, it collapses. And, and so one of the uh, uh, examples that I always cite uh, that is to me iconic was the uh, Packinghouse Workers Union, which was a union that really got race. They were organizing workers mainly white and African-American, but they got race. And they integrated the fight around racism into the way that they operated in terms of their demands, everything else. I contrast that with many other organizations that take essentially a tactical approach, either trying to avoid directly dealing with race, you know, sort of let's find common demands that won't piss off anybody, and let's join together and sing Kumbaya, right? Or the other extreme is where people um, uh, ignore the importance of building alliances at all. And this is one of the problems in the current moment, I think in some elements of the Black Lives Matter movement, where there are forces that don't appreciate that we've got to build an incredibly broad movement in this country of 350 plus million people. And it's not going to be just African Americans that are going to pull this one off. So we've got to walk this balance. But at the level of strategy, I think we have to understand that there's some folks that are going to side with us on some battles, but they're not going to be with us for the long haul. And that's okay as long as we're aware of that. And we've got to be pushing the Democrats as a party to the left to be addressing these issues that are rooted in the struggles working class people. I think that they're saying right now that voters that were making under $100,000 tended to be uh, on the side of uh, Biden and those above uh, Trump, which made perfect sense. And it, and it also completely contradicted this whole narrative about how it was uh, the Trump base was all these white workers that were running around crazy. I agree with uh, Bill, you know, it can't just be about mobilizing people. We definitely need to work on strategy. And I think a big part of that is studying our history, you know, the education um, into what past has happened in past movements. Uh, during this, you know, COVID shutdown time, I've been studying just leading up to the Civil War during the Civil War and Reconstruction, and I just have found it to be so relevant still today. And I think that's something that we should all be taking time right now to look at because 
you know, during Reconstruction, we had the largest redistribution of wealth in history. How do we do that? You know, people talk about this time being so polarized, but what time could have been more polarized than that? And we've also can see coming out of that the largest transformation. So it gives me some hope. I mean, obviously later reconstruction uh, fell apart and Jim Crow and, but it, you know, we, the people can win demands if we work at it, so. So here we are in this interregnum, interregnum period. Um, and anything could happen between now and inauguration day. So, and we don't know what, what fight the right is really gonna put up towards the end of this. It has, we haven't seen what's bubbled. For, there have been little signs bubbling to the first surface, but we really haven't seen it really blow up. We'll see what happens in the coming month and a half. Having said that, you know, the, the, the question is, what do progressives do at this moment? If Biden, when Biden becomes president, he could um, institute the Vacancies Act and put who he wants on the, in the cabinet and not kowtow to the right about who he nominates. Um, he could adjourn Congress and do all kinds of appointments, and he can do these massive amounts of executive orders, turning things over. I mean, it seems to me that somehow the progressive movement, in terms of the Democrats, have to come up with a strategy to push that if anything is going to begin to change. And you, so your thoughts on that. Bill, go ahead. I see you nodding. I'll let I, you start. I, I couldn't agree more. I think that that's exactly what has to happen. Um, and, I, and it goes back to what I was saying about audacity. Uh, I, and I, I think he's going to have to move very quickly. Um, I think that the, this next period is very dangerous. Um, and that there could be anything from right-wing terrorist attacks, assassination attempts, other kinds of provo provocations, to a generalized obstruction. What we're seeing right now, you know, the failure of um, GSA to uh, sign off on a transition, you know, things like that, that could really muck things up. Um, so I think that we're gonna have to keep very, very, uh, very much on alert. Uh, because if the right wing starts uh, any significant mass mobilizations, we're going to have to out-organize them. We have to, we'll have to just, you know, anytime they show up, we have to have double the number of people on our side that are showing up. Uh, because what I believe that they're going to try to do is to discredit the legitimacy of the election and to try to carry out various things, and you saw some of this during the Obama administration, where there, was, there were various forms of local obstruction and the suggestions of laws that actually don't exist that give uh, authority at the local level to fail, failure to implement uh, various statutes. So I think that that's what we're looking at. I think we'll definitely see Biden do a, you know, a lot of executive orders to try to get things back to where we were at with Obama. Um, I can see the, the names being floated for his cabinet are not um, from the progressive wing. <laughs> so that's disappointing, but you know, predictable. My fear is that he'll reverse, you know, some of these Trump uh, orders and then people will just kind of like, you know, people are exhausted. They're just gonna kind of be like, okay, we're fine, you know, thank God, you know, what a relief. And then any valid criticisms of Biden are going to be met with, well, at least it's not Trump. And that's my fear. Because Trumpism isn't going away. I mean, Trump was an incompetent authoritarian. <laughs> so we could be seeing Trump run again, we could be seeing Tom Cotton or someone Hence, someone who would be a more competent authoritarian coming out in response to Biden, you know, more years of moderate Dems. So I think the antidote is definitely what Bill said, pushing as hard as we can left, you know, pushing for a working class agenda. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see how this conversation unfolds in the coming weeks and months as we see what happens between now and January. And I think that 
the, what you both have said here are really important. And I do think we, as Bill have said, we, we, we are facing a real potential for serious violence and danger uh, in the immediate future. Um, there's no question in my mind about that. That could be right there. It's too quiet right now, which makes me very nervous. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and uh, it's always quiet before a storm and a fight, as I've always experienced in my, in my old life here. <laughs> I think that's, that is, could be the case. But I think that there, there, there is a struggle ahead of us. And you all have outlined it. And I just really, uh, both A, appreciate the work both of you do out there uh, and that you are doing. It's really important. Uh, Shana East, I'm glad you could join us here. Um, it's uh, really good to have you with us. And we look forward to having you many more times on the air with us, because it's great. Thanks, um, And we continue to have many PPC people on Poor People's Campaign uh, because we do a lot of work for them. And, and uh, Bill Fletcher, it's always a pleasure to have you with us. I just your history of uh, organizing and, uh, and, and, and uh, your strategic thinking is always important for us to listen to in the years. So thank you. I thank you both Pleasure. so much for joining us. It was great. I hope and trust you enjoyed that conversation. Let me know what you think. You can write to me at mark with a C at therealnews.com. But before you do that, check out our next segment today. We're talking with Wendy Davis, who was one of the original members of the Chicago 7 or Chicago 8 when you count Bobby Seale. He was a former member and founder of the Students for a Democratic Society and the National Mobilization Committee to End the War in Vietnam. Now, the trial of the Chicago 7 that was recently released on Netflix, as I said earlier, takes us back to that moment in time that's supremely relevant to what we face today. It tells the story of what happened to the anti-Vietnam War protesters in August of 1968, who were attacked by the police and then had his leadership put on trial. Aaron Sorkin's The Trial of Chicago 7 was recently released by Netflix. And it takes us back to a moment that is supremely relevant to what we're facing today. It tells a story of what happened to the anti-Vietnam War protesters at the August 1968 Democratic Convention. For people who were not there to witness it, it really opens up many doors, it seems. It tells a story of violent police attacks on demonstrators, how federal government and its city government in Chicago conspired to infiltrate anti-war groups and incite violence. In the courtroom itself, Black Panthers Bobby Seale and Fred Hampton their treatment is illustrated in this film. It all serves as a really sobering reminder of the deadly racial disparities experienced by protesters, but we still face today. It sounds eerily familiar to what we're witnessing today as well. The film from the creator of The West Wing and the writer of Social Network is categorized as a historical legal drama. So the expectation is that that entertainment will often trump facts, no pun intended, uh, that this is further complicated here because the trial itself is plagued by a lack of transparency with a judge who was clearly out of his mind and rapidly biased against the defendants. So here to talk about that film and to connect the dots of those movements happening now and then is Rennie Davis. He was one of the original members of the Chicago 7, uh, and he also was a leader of SDS and the organization called ERAP, which I was part of way back in the day, and the National Mobilization to End the War, and joins us here today. And Rennie, thank you for joining us and taking the time today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Take us back for a moment um, and take us back to that time in 1968 and describe just for our viewers the feel of that moment, what was taking place, why people were in Chicago, what the demonstrations were about, what the whole atmosphere of the moment was like in that country. Well, there was a recognition that our government was out of control in Vietnam. And uh, it started with students, but it was spreading to the whole country. But uh, Johnson was president, he was orchestrating the war and you know, a sitting president, nobody was gonna challenge. And so the anti-war movement really became the only voice. Uh, so we believed, I believed uh, that it would be possible to bring a half million people to Chicago to protest the war. That literally it'd be a rank and file walkout of many Democrats would, would join us. Now, uh, I was the coordinator of a large coalition. We had 150 national groups uh, participating. Uh, Martin Luther King was in our coalition. Uh, we had put on large scale uh, demonstrations with no incidents. We were committed to nonviolence. We were able to do this, you know, but uh, what came out of left field was basically sort of similar to today. I mean, just the a mayor who decided to take the First Amendment and the right to petition the government for redress of grievances and throw it out the window and deny permits. 
So we had a difficult choice to, you know, do we go uh, stand up for the First Amendment? Uh, you know, obviously our numbers were going to be seriously reduced, mostly young people with tremendous courage. We knew we were going into a hot zone, uh, but we went. And what happened was uh, on the opening day, we were camped out in a park. Curfew came in the park at 11 o'clock or 11 p.m. And uh, police gathered and in they came, beating and clubbing and gassing. It wasn't just demonstrators who were being beaten. It was also newsmen. I mean, people that everybody knew, you know, all the major networks had their lead anchors, you know, in the, in the park with us, they were beaten. You know, I watched people sitting on their doorstep, you know, outside their home, just trying to see what was going on. And they were gassed and beaten. And this was a television event. I mean, it's, it's hard to explain it. I mean, more people watched what was happening to us in Chicago than the moment uh, that was watched on television when the first man landed on the moon. So it's it just a gigantic event that uh, had a huge impact on the country. There actually was a Gallup poll that showed a majority of the country supported the government in a distant war two weeks before this demonstration and two weeks after the demonstration, the same Gallup poll showed a majority of the American people now supported our position, which is to get out and come back and, and wrap it up. <laughs> you know, so, so it was you know, a huge impact. And after it was all over, there was a study uh, by you know presidential commission who caused the riots in Chicago uh, you know, I mean, there have been, uh, I mean, it was probably the best thing ever written about me. I was in charge of permit negotiation. And, you know, I actually worked with Ramsey Clark and his office to, you know, get permits. And so, you know, so this commission, you know, described it as a police riot. So that was sort of the, the final, you know, declaration of what was going on, you know, and so with that, the new administration, the Nixon administration, decided to invite uh, myself and seven others uh, for a new law that had just been recently passed when Martin Luther King was assassinated and riots exploded in 100 cities in America. This law was passed and we were the first victims of this law. It made it a crime to cross an interstate uh, line, you know, to you know, use the internet, inter, interstate commerce, uh, and it was basically it was an amazing <laughs> argument. You know, if you were a speaker like myself and you crossed the state line to make a speech, uh, and there was a, a riot that resulted, which might happen two years after you spoke, and what you you know, it was your, it was your intention, which was described by what you wrote or what you said. And a riot was defined in the assembly of three or more people, one of whom threatened to violate a law. So, I mean, you could have three kids on a street corner, one raising a clenched fist, and that could constitute the riot. And if I came in and made a speech and that happened, then I could face five years in jail. And if I was charged with conspiracy to do this, which we were also done, then we'd add another five years. So we were facing 10 years in prison. The New York Times on the opening day of the trial called it the most significant political trial in American history. And it certainly lived up to its then, you know, it was, you know, our jury was mostly young people. I mean, we had literally millions and millions of people just cheering us on. And it was so, so, powerful and profound. I mean, I, uh, we had bail and so I could speak every night, you know, a small turnout was 10,000 people. If I, if the governor called out the National Guard because I was speaking, then I would speak in a stadium. And this was every night. And basically at the end, uh, when Nixon invaded Cambodia, the, the Chicago Seven as we came to be known, because Bobby Seale was severed from the trial, we went from eight to seven. Okay, we called for a student strike and 90% of American universities and colleges went out on strike. Okay, so it would just give you a little feel for this period 
and the enormity of, of the support that we had. And, and uh, basically, fundamentally, what we did was we put the government on trial. And uh, with the election a few days away and people panicking that this might be our last election today, you know, certainly everybody's on the edge of their seat with what's going to happen and the fear, you know, uh, it's, it's a profound message right now that, that human beings in large numbers really can't stand up and make a difference. I mean, there are, the parallels to what's happening at this moment are, are pretty incredible to me. I mean, what you just said, I mean, people looked at that election in some similar ways, even though I think what we're facing now is, is uh, some real question of neo-fascism neo and authoritarianism, and it's a very scary moment we're all in. Um, but there are a lot of parallels, I mean, uh, to, what's, to, to, to what's going on with the Black Lives Matter movement, with, with um, the kind of, it, 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 in some ways, the 60s was the explosion of consciousness about race and racism in America and the depth of it. But, and, 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 and I think now we're seeing people, even in a greater degree, seeing how deep and profound it is and how it really affects the entire society, which is why you had 23 million people in the street uh, after George Floyd across the country and across the world. So, I mean, say that, but the, and the, so, you know, I, I wrestle a lot with what 1968 and, and 2020 have to say to one another. Yeah, well, I, I really agree, you know, um, I, you know, in one way, people who were defendants or family of the defendants, you know, I think about Adam Rubin, who was uh, Jerry Rubin, he was a defendant, uh, his son, you know, uh, I mean, Jerry in the movie is portrayed as a drug addict who teaches demonstrators how to make Molotov cocktails. <laughs> and, you know, and they're just, some terrible things, you know, I mean, from the insider point of view, we were kind of aghast by many things, you know. Uh, I'm kind of this nerdy guy that, you know, is afraid of his own shadow. And, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's pretty hysterical. I think they did a pretty good job of Abby Hoffman. You know, I liked his character, you know, it was, it was, it was good. But, you know, I, I don't, uh, I'm, I'm supporting Netflix and this movie because it, one, it brings out memories. The timing is, is impeccable, you know, to have the voice of the Chicago 7 return right now at this time, you know, and it, it does in, in, some, in, a, in a good degree. You know, I think the movie would have been far more powerful if it just stayed closer to what actually happened. But uh, nevertheless, it, for many people like ourselves, and you know, it brings up the memories of that time. And for a new generation, you know, it's it's truly inspiring to see that you know it, that happened then, and it can happen again today. So, I, I was thinking about what you just said. I mean, the, the, when you look at the, your portrayal um, as this little nerdy kid, which wasn't you, to uh, Tom Hayden as being somebody who just talks about having elections, which he really didn't do <laughs> at that <laughs> right. time. Yeah. That was hysterical. <laughs> <laughs> so Dave Dellinger throwing a punch. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> and and the, who was a man whose life was dedicated to being a, a nonviolent pacifist activist, right. um, who was looked up to by all the other defendants and many of us, um, yes. and, and, uh, and sidelining people like Freunds and Weiner, who, um, you know, I, I didn't know Weiner, but I did know Freunds back in the day pretty well. And, and um, it, it's, it's just, it, it was that, that part really was kind of bothered me, but it didn't seem to bother folks who were looking at it fresh. Yeah. So I, right. maybe it's just yeah. us old that, farts we get bothered by yeah, that. That's, that's exactly <laughs> right. I mean, when I want to, you know, get a little depressed about the movie, I just go to my Facebook page and watch all of people. Well, this is the greatest movie and thank you. <laughs> you know, so it's having a really positive effect on so many people. So, uh, so I, you know, I, I welcome opportunities to, to talk like this. We're kind of set the record straight a little bit, but, but the spirit of the Chicago seven is, you know, alive and well. So one of the things I do to, to, to focus on for a minute here, I, I was thinking about a lot about the, um, uh, the portrayal of Bobby Seale and how that happened in this movie. Um, and I want to talk a bit about that. I mean, I think, you know, this was a time when, um, first of all, I was thinking, as I told you before we started, I, I watched for the first time this 1987 movie, Con The Conspiracy Trial of Chicago 8, um, that was dramatic 
Um, it was a, in the taken with the court documents, really well acted, and then interspersed with some real commentary from you and Tom Hayden, Dellinger, Bobby Seale, and the others. Um, and that was all in there. But one of the things that, you know, I think people didn't really, at least I didn't get from this movie, maybe other people did, um, is, is what, the effect of what happened to Bobby Seale in that trial. Yeah. The horrendous nature of how he was dragged and, I mean, a, a gagged and, and, and bound. Um, th that the fact that, that this is a time when Fred Hampton, who led the Chicago Panthers, was murdered when the trial was going on. Yeah. Um, you know, so I mean, to me, um, and at the same time, the Panther 21 trial uh, was, was, was exploding and, and uh, Fini Shakur um, actually defended herself, which is what Bobby wanted to do. So, I mean, so that, that part of the moment really didn't come through. And I think that was so vital, important to how it speaks to today, but it also as vital, important in terms of what it meant then. Right. Yeah, so, you know, just to quickly take your listeners who may not know this story, Bobby Steele was chairman of the Black Panther Party. I had invited, you know, a, a member of the of Gallery of Cleaver to come and speak in Chicago. The last minute he couldn't come. And so he asked Bobby if he could take his place. I had never met Bobby Seal at that point. And so Bobby came and made two speeches. And, you know, with all the hectic everything going on, you know, I didn't even get a chance to say hello to Bobby during the time. But for those two speeches, now he was facing 10 years in jail. And, and you know, part of this was a conspiracy, you know, which meant that Bobby and I planned this together in secret, you know, <laughs> to have riots in Chicago. So uh, Bobby uh, had a lawyer who was very gifted and, and had, was facing gallbladder surgery uh, and asked for a continuance and the judge turned the continuance down. So Bobby decided to represent himself. So what happened was it started slowly, really. I mean, basically a witness would be on the stand, mention Bobby's name, and Bobby would stand up to cross-examine the witness. And, and the judge just would go into a hysterical fit. You know, there were huge marshals, I mean, big guys, you know, in the courtroom, about 30 usually at a time. And they would be ordered by the judge to put Bobby back in his seat. And so this is how it built. It, you know, it built slowly but steadily as Bobby was literally being forced to sit down. You don't quite get this in the movie. You, you know, you get a sense of it, what it is, but not the drama that was going on. And then one morning, uh, Bobby, you know, is late coming out. <laughs> he, he, he doesn't have bail. And so uh, we're all sitting there at the table waiting for him to appear and out he comes. He's, being in, he's in a chair, he's carried by four marshals. He's chained and gagged in his chair. And he just sent him, you know, just comes in and he puts him right next to me. And he's got a gauze in his mouth with pressure band-aids all wrapped around his head. So he can't talk, but he can talk. And he says, I demand my right to represent myself, you know, and the jury can clearly hear him. So with this, the, the, the you know, you kind of get in the movie that it all might have happened in one day, didn't it? This was stretched out about four days and basically it just, it gets more and more intense. I mean, literally by the fourth day, I would see, I mean, there was literally blood coming out of the side of his mouth from this pressure that, I mean, it would just go on for hours beforehand forcing this gauze into his mouth and then more and more band-aids and still at the end you could I demand my constitutional rights I mean he was so garbled but he could definitely be heard by the jury but the most important thing Mark really was that he was heard everywhere he was heard throughout the continent of Africa South America Asia you know all of Europe heard him Canada heard him the United States everywhere in the United States the voice, I mean, here was a black man chained and gagged in a federal courtroom in the United States because he could not represent himself. And you do not get that enormous power that was happening on a global basis from the movie. And also during your trial, Fred Hampton was, was murdered by the Chicago police. He was, and it, I mean, this was just, I mean, this was probably the most upsetting single thing that happened to us. I mean, you know, we just, we came to 
to trial one morning and, you know, got the news. And I mean, it, it was pretty difficult just to, to contain ourselves, you know. I always felt myself to be pretty even keeled, even though I was, we were all united against the war in Vietnam. But if there was ever a speech where I more or less lost it, it was that day. <laughs> I went out at noon at, in front of the federal courthouse. And it was just, I mean, we were just beside ourselves, you know. I mean, he basically, Fred Hampton was asleep in bed. And, you know, 30 policemen just came storming into his, his, his apartment and, and murdered him in bed. And it was just, uh, it was just, I mean, I don't know what they, we had no words for it. I mean, we were just so stunned by, by the, you know, the violence of, of the police force. You're talking a bit about the effect that that trial actually had on that moment in history. But, but then, and also fast forwarding to now, and how much has not changed, especially when you talk about the kind of, police and state violence that you see on the screen every day and the rise of right-wing militias and all that taking place. And, the, and, and it, what hasn't changed, but also just that how profoundly that your trial of the eight of you did change America. Yeah, it's both are true. You know, I mean, basically uh, there, there has been really significant change, but and it just seems like droplets you know it's not a downpour change and we're still facing all the same issues and now perhaps you know it's more serious than ever before you know we're, we're actually going into a time where it just seems like not only is the republic eroding but uh the republic really could end and uh and yet this the message is still the same you know we're all here and we can basically be intimidated and go underground or say nothing or basically we can mobilize ourselves to basically change the outcome and it's the same message that we had in 68. Uh, we did change the outcome in 68 and and we we can in fact we must do it again i mean i was a community organizer at that time you know the last thing in the world i thought would i would ever change but you know, I could see what was coming, and I let let that basically sink in, and I, and I realized that this is where it's going. You know, it wasn't something that we concocted in a conference or a planning meeting or anything. It was an event, you know. And I would say it's very similar today that we're going into a, a moment where it's really a good idea to look up and notice the horizon because events are coming. I mean, of course, we all want a vaccine and we all want to go back to normal, but not according to the events that are right in front of us that we can see, you know. I don't think we're ever going back to normal. This really is a time like no other. And basically, I mean, if you, I mean, just to give you a quick sense, I mean, everybody knows it's warming up and everybody can figure out that warming up means accelerating droughts. But, but you really need to understand that means aquifer depletion is going to accelerate and that means food distribution chains are going to begin to snap. And, you know, I, I, I'm not a dooms person, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm totally optimistic, but when I see events coming, you know, I see people are gonna, everybody has to eat and, and, and people that you would not even imagine are gonna start to think, you know, I think I have to grow my own food. And that means that they're going to be moving towards intentional communities because you've got to hook up with each other. And in those intentional communities, I mean, or they're already existing all over the place, but not in the millions and millions. And that's what I see coming. Intentional communities that basically want to live, grow, and thrive in an age of extinction is going to become the network that's going to create a nation for a, a new way of living on Earth. And so it's, it's a long-term vision that is the place where lots of people are now putting their hope for the future of the human race. We could actually create the future of humanity out of this present time. Well, Randy Davis, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Good to see you. Um, yeah, good and, to see you too again, Mark. Thanks. Yeah, good to see you doing so well. And uh, thank you so much for joining us here on the Mark Steiner Show, The Real News today. It's good to have you with us. Okay, thanks again. Thank you for joining us today on The Mark Steiner Show.
So for producer Erica Blount and video editor Seba Petruskin, I'm Mark Steiner for The Real News Network. Thanks so much for joining us. Let us know what you think and take care.